China is colluding with Cuba to spy on the U.S. At least that's what a new Wall Street Journal report alleges. This week, we'll dive into this story and more on The China Report. Welcome to The China Report, a new show produced in collaboration with Pivot to Peace. Our understanding of China and U.S.-China relations has become a defining feature of all global politics. Every week, we'll help you sort through all the propaganda with an independent view of the country that we're taught to hate, yet know so little about. I'm your host, Amanda Yi, and this is my co-host, KJ No. KJ, good to see you again. How are you? I'm doing well. Good to see you. This week, we're going to talk about a new report in the Wall Street Journal about China supposedly spying on the U.S. through its spy bases in Cuba. But first, let's kick it off with the headlines. China has passed a new law strengthening the rights of urban collective organizations that collectively own the land in rural and suburban China. In China, since the revolution, all urban land is owned by the state and all rural land is owned by local people's collectives or co-ops that own and manage the land collectively. According to the text of the law, the new legislation is designed to promote high quality development and management of the rural collective economy and to promote common prosperity. The new legislation also highlights the importance for rural collectives to adhere to the socialist ownership system adhere to democratic management and safeguard the rights of the collective and its members. In particular, Article 8 ensures that collectively owned land cannot be misappropriated and that women cannot be discriminated against in their ownership of the land due to marriage or marital status. In the past, this has been a problem when some women joined their husbands in a new rural area, losing some of their original land rights from their natal village while not acquiring new rights in the new locality. This contradiction between traditional patrilocal marriage customs and a socialist collective ownership system is one of the issues this new legislation is attempting to address. U.S. creates high-tech global supply chains to blunt risks tied to China. As part of what Washington officials call chip diplomacy, the Biden administration is negotiating with other countries to rework supply chain manufacturing of semiconductors to be less reliant on China. The plan would include convincing foreign companies to invest in chip making in the United States and then finding partner countries to set up factories to finish the work. These countries now in the program include Costa Rica, Indonesia, Mexico, Panama, the Philippines, Vietnam, and U.S. officials are in talks with Kenya currently. The goal of this plan is to eventually move semiconductor manufacturing away from China, which boasts a growing chip-making industry, and also Taiwan, which is the center of chip technology. This is with the aim of thwarting China's economic development. The World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA, has criticized a U.S. criminal investigation into alleged doping violations by Chinese swimmers in 2021. WADA had previously confirmed the doping findings as accidental contamination. In 2021, 23 Chinese swimmers tested positive for trace amounts of the banned heart medicine trimetazidine, TMZ, according to tests by the Chinese doping agency. This was reported to WADA. Further investigation and analysis by the local regulatory agency showed that the amounts were non-performance enhancing uh, and that of the 200 Chinese swimmers, only the swimmers at one hotel tested positive and that the fluctuating nature, negative then positive then negative again, of the test results indicated accidental contamination from the hotel's kitchen where TMZ traces were found. WADA concurred with these findings. Guided by science and expert consultations, we stand by that good faith determination in the face of the incomplete and misleading news reports on which this investigation appears to be based. Both the International Olympic Committee and WADA have criticized the U.S. law 
that gives the U.S. long arm jurisdiction to prosecute suspected doping violations outside of its territory. Japan Philippines signed defense pact with eyes on China. On Monday, Japan and the Philippines signed a defense agreement allowing the deployment of troops on each other's soil over purported mutual concerns over China's military power. As part of the pact, Japanese forces will be allowed to deploy in the Philippines for military drills, and the Filipino military will be allowed to carry out combat training in Japan. The signing of the pact comes as Japan and the Philippines, both U.S. allies, are challenging China's historical claims in the South China Sea with the support of, U- of the United States. The agreement must be ratified by both countries' legislatures in order to take effect. Chinese scientists at the University of Science and Technology of China say they have developed a solid electrolyte that could allow the manufacture of inexpensive solid-state lithium batteries for EVs. The new sulfide solid electrolyte, LPSO, is synthesized from low-cost compounds and is priced at 8% of what other similar components cost. This has the potential to give China a breakthrough in rechargeable battery technology, as using these solid electrolytes could improve the performance and safety of batteries while allowing faster charging, all at a fraction of the cost of the competition. Japan vows more openness on U.S. military sex crimes. The Japanese government has pledged to stop withholding information from authorities over sex crimes committed by the U.S. military stationed in the country. This came after media exposed a U.S. Air Force soldier had kidnapped and raped an underage girl in Okinawa in December of 2023. This and at least three other sex crimes committed by U.S. military personnel in Okinawa were withheld by police from regional authorities. Okinawa is the site of 32 U.S. military bases, which are key to the U.S. strategy of containing China. U.S. troops, meanwhile, due to status of forces agreements, can be exempt from local investigation, arrest, and prosecution for crimes committed on Japanese territory under official duty unless the U.S. relinquishes jurisdiction jurisdiction or immunity. And now to our main story. Uh, Last week, the Wall Street Journal released uh, an article about uh, China supposedly spying on the U.S., on the U.S., through secret spy uh, bases located in Cuba. Now, to be clear, this story is basically a follow-up from another Wall Street Journal uh, article that was published in June of 2023 of last year. Um, And in this article, it basically said that that there was a spy base in Bejucal, Cuba, and China was using it to spy on the U.S., Now, this article that was released uh, about a week ago claims that the spy bases have expanded beyond Bejucal uh, into several other towns uh, in Cuba. So the previous report, the previous Wall Street Journal report was based on um, unnamed anonymous U.S. intelligence officials um, that had spoken to the media, while this report is based on um, a report that was released by the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And for its part, uh, China has denied these allegations. Uh, Cuba has denied these allegations. Cuban officials have taken to Twitter to deny these allegations. Um, The president of Cuba himself, Miguel Diaz-Canal, sort of you know, posted a joke tweet on Twitter, um, and he and it had a picture of uh, like what looks like a baseball base, and it says um, "installed Chinese bases in Cuba." So clearly, uh, to them, there doesn't seem to be a lot of veracity in this report. Um, and also, you know, last year when the original Wall Street Journal article was released, Breakthrough News sent a reporter to Beihu Call, um, and he interviewed a lot of the residents there, um, asked them if they knew anything about uh, a spy base in their town, and all the people that he interviewed basically had no idea what he was talking about. So, KJ, what do you make of these reports? Uh, How much truth is in these reports? And do you think China is setting up a spy base in Cuba, or is this all U.S. propaganda? 
I tend to think that it's the latter. It's U.S. propaganda. CSIS, you know, has a long history of being a neocon propaganda machine. We can go more into that later. But if you read through this article, uh, which is highly designed, it's an interactive article, it's packed full of graphics. Uh, and if you look at the actual claims, it says that these are based on, quote, unsubstantiated rumors and, quote, unverifiable sources. In other words, it has absolutely no proof. It has nothing. There's nothing there. But it does have a very, very, uh, you know, expertly designed interactive graphic article, which I think, you know, is uh, designed to cover up the paucity of its proof. But the way that I see it is that, you know, there has been a very, very extensive trope in the US media that China is spying on you everywhere and through everything. You know, China is spying on you through phones, routers, subway cars, uh, EVs, toasters, refrigerators, coffee makers, balloons, cranes, pagodas, TikTok, etc. And for me, not to psychologize the issue, but this reminds me of, you know, the, the very narcissistic person who goes to the gym and then they live stream themselves and say, everybody is staring at me you know, <laughs> and how important that is. And you know, I just want to say that, no, you are not the center of the universe, you know, and this is really a kind of, um, it's, it's a kind of surveillance narcissism. You know, it's a narcissistic surveillance ideation disorder if we, you know, wanted to coin a, uh, you know, a term for it, but essentially, you know, I don't think there's any proof there. You know, they've given us satellite imagery, uh, and then they say they looked at four active sites capable of, not conducting, but capable of conducting electronic surveillance uh, operations. They don't say what they mean by active. You know, active could mean playing volleyball. And then they say that these four sites are among the most likely location supporting China's efforts to spy on the United States. In other words, they have nothing. They have absolutely nothing there except a very, very highly uh, produced uh, graphic article. And then the other thing that I'll point out, I think the irony is perhaps missed on them, is one of the bases they claim is too close to uh, the U.S. base on Guantanamo. And, you know, my <laughs> response to that would be, why does the United States have a base uh, on Cuba? Why does the base, why does the US have a base on Guantanamo? And didn't Barack Obama run on a platform of closing Guantanamo eight years ago? Why is that base still open? I mean, very easy to reduce uh, or to prevent that surveillance if it were actually happening simply by closing the base and, uh, and, and following up on, mm -hmm. you know, promises. No, and thank you. Yes, first of all, the hypocrisy of the U.S. to accuse Cuba of, you know, spying on the U.S., uh, accusing China of uh, operating a spy base in Cuba when the U.S. itself has uh, a naval base in Cuba, Guantanamo. It's right there. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention was, you know, you know, as you said, the the CSIS, the CSIS report, was based on um, supposed analysis of satellite images. And I think it's a really good opportunity we have to talk about like think tanks like CSIS. Um, you know, this is a think tank which has produced, you know, regular policy reports on China, regular policy reports on Korea. And it has a, like a really large influence on the way that these two countries are portrayed in the media, right? Um, these reports influence legislation, they influence policy, and these reports often get uh, cited by mainstream uh, papers like the New York Times, like the Washington Post, like the Wall Street Journal, uh, as authorities on China and uh, North Korea. Um, and not only that, CSIS reps are often asked uh, for quotes uh, to provide uh, to provide quotes to these same media outlets on articles on China, on articles on Korea. Um, and so it really shapes uh, 
you know, our understanding of these two countries. And not only that, but CSIS also, uh, you know, they hold conferences in which they invite defense contractors and national security officials. And, you know, it's at these conferences that, um, you know, uh, these same defense contractors can bid on government contracts. So it's this like uh, interwoven web of uh, these different institutions that like interact with one another. You know, you have DC policy think tanks, national uh, national security officials, and um, and defense contractors, and they're all part of this like military industrial complex. Um, and I think you know one really important thing that we have to point out is that think tanks like CSIS they receive a significant amount of funding from defense contractors. Um, I was writing an article about a year ago, uh, like on this kind of funding, and I dug up an annual report uh, from CSIS. It was for the fiscal year 2019-2020. And in that year alone, you know, they don't, it doesn't tell you exactly how much money that these defense contractors ha have given. Uh, to CSIS, it has uh, brackets, and that kind of gives you an idea. So the top bracket is for those who have um, who have donated half a million dollars or more, five hundred thousand dollars or more, and in that bracket is Northrop Grumman, war profiteer Northrop Grumman, right? And then the second bracket is you know donations of two hundred thousand dollars to. Four hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars, and in that bracket is uh, War Profiteer General Atomics, as well as uh, Lockheed Martin and SAIC. Uh, and SAIC provides information technology services to the U.S. military, right? Um, and then below in the last bracket are for those who have donated a hundred thousand dollars to a hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars. Um, and in that bracket, we have Boeing, we have General Dynamics, we have Hitachi, we have Mitsubishi, Samsung, Raytheon. So clearly all these defense contractors have a stake in U.S. military operations in China and in Korea. And so, you know, they stand to make money off of this kind of uh, warmongering, you know. They can uh, sell their services in monitoring uh, U uh, Chinese military activities. Uh, they can build missile defense systems. They can provide weapons, drone ships, aircraft, if it ever comes to that. Um, CSIS, I believe, also receives funding from pretty much every Western government and their allies, uh, including the U.S., uh, it receives funding from the Canadian government, from the UAE government, from Japan. Uh, it also receives funding from NATO. Uh, so, you know, clearly this is all a huge conflict of interest. And the fact that they're uh, producing these reports talking about, you know, how we need to start a war with China, that's a clear conflict. That's a clear conflict of interest, right? So, KJ, I'm interested in, you know, what you think about all this, how much does this funding affect the way that CSIS reports on on places like China? Well, I think it's very, very important. Certainly the conflict of interests are over the top. And if we go into the history of CSIS, it actually was part of Georgetown University. It was a research institution inside of Georgetown University. And then eventually Georgetown disavowed it and and, and they went their separate ways, partly according to, you know, insiders, because Georgetown was very, very uncomfortable with the amount of funding that it was getting from military contractors. Uh, also, they were very uncomfortable with its policies. Uh, as I said before, you know, it is uh, extreme right-wing hawkish neocon think tank. And its primary product is uh, propaganda. It's uh, elite propaganda to manufacture consent amongst its, you know, elite NATSEC, uh, you know, uh, NATSEC elites. And it's often been, you know, described as a parking lot for neocon hotshots. Uh, we, we can think of people like Dick Cheney, Michael Ledeen, 
the uh, one of the EDs was uh, CIA uh, Directorate of Intelligence, the director of the Director of Intelligence, uh, Ray Klein. Uh, we can think of uh, you know people like uh, Henry Kissinger and uh, uh, other very very high level national security. Uh, deep state uh, heavyweights. It's kind of been functioned uh, as almost like a shadow government for them uh, in a parliamentary system. And so I think it has extraordinary conflicts of interest. As you pointed out, it gets money from the government, uh, apparently 40 to 50 million per year from the US government. Uh, it's very, very well funded. It has, you know, a hundred million dollar building. And so it really is this bastion of uh, national security elites that create uh, a media and uh, elite consensus around proper, uh, around, uh, around policy uh, through the use of very, very skilled uh, propaganda. And it's clear, it's clear that this is what is happening in this situation. Yeah, so you kind of touched on this before, but I, I just want to read something from the CSIS report. Um, this sentence, it's, it's quite stunning. Cuba has a long history of hosting foreign espionage operations targeting the United States. This is from the CSIS report. Um, I mean, I, I find that statement really striking because, you know, a lot of people who like follow China and uh, U.S.-China relations, we always say every accusation is a confession, right? Um, is the U.S. really trying to accuse other countries of hosting overseas bases? You know, I think I mentioned this earlier, but it's the U.S. that has, you know, over 750 military bases spread across over 80 different countries, right? It has a military base in Cuba, uh, Guantanamo, the naval base in Gu Guantanamo, which has been there for a really long time against the demands of the Cuban people for it to close. Um, and, you know, this is just like part of a long U.S. history of the U.S. government demonizing, like not only China, but also Cuba as well, right? Um, in the decades since the 1959 Cuban Revolution, it's the U.S. that has, you know, continually launched uh, terrorist attacks against the island, against the people of the island, in order to overthrow, um, you know, the socialist government there and overthrow, um, you know, the revolutionary process uh, that was triggered by the revolution. Um, you know, I'm thinking about most famously the Bay of Pigs invasion, but also, you know, the U.S. government was enlisting people to terrorize Cuba, enlisting people to bomb uh, hotels in Cuba to, like, hurt their tourism industry, which, uh, you know, it was getting a lot of money from. They enlisted people to hijack planes. Uh, the U.S. government, the CIA, was backing um, basically Cuban exiles uh, in the United States stationed in Miami who were plotting terrorist attacks uh, from Miami to overthrow Castro's government in the decades following um, the revolution, right? And so I think uh, in total, almost 3,500 people in Cuba were killed because of these of these terrorist attacks uh, that the U.S. Uh, had backed. And so, you know, other countries are not stupid. Cuba recognizes this. China recognizes this. And in fact, in the Wall Street Journal article, uh, there was a quote from Liu Pengyu, who's a spokesperson for China's embassy in Washington. And he said in the article, the U.S. is no doubt the leading power in terms of eavesdropping and does not even spare its allies. The U.S. side has repeatedly hyped up China's establishment of spy bases or conducting surveillance activities in Cuba, which is true, right? Uh, other countries recognize this. Um, in 2013, for example, NSA whistleblower uh, Edward Snowden uh, had revealed that the U.S. had been tapping uh, Angela Merkel's phone for years, uh, and she didn't even know it. You know, this is Germany. This is an ally of the United States. 
Last year, leaked intelligence doc documents showed that the U.S. had been recording internal discussions between South Korean uh, officials. You know, South Korea, again, uh, an ally of the U.S. So maybe I shouldn't be surprised about this, but, you know, I don't know how you feel, but I'm constantly astounded by, you know, what the U.S. accuses other countries of doing and just its overall hypocrisy. I, I think the hypocrisy is, is never, uh, you know, it, it never ceases to astound me, the degree of hypocrisy. As you said, the accusation is a confession. The U.S., uh, you know, taps, surveils, uh, spies on everything and everyone. Uh, and then it, uh, you know, projects its own guilt onto uh, other countries and other nations, other agents. But, um, you know, just, I mean, just to think of another example, which, you know, was in the, in the, in the news previously, uh, remember when that uh, weather balloon floated over yes. the U.S., they claimed that it was uh, a spy balloon. Now, you know, the Chinese have at least four satellites in geosynchronous orbit. They have another 140 in low Earth orbit and 300 in lower orbit. So if they wanted to, they could scan and surveil anything they wanted to, as can the U.S. They are a major space power. But somehow we are supposed to believe that the Chinese are using a non-steerable, enormous, highly visible, highly vulnerable, easily interceptable 18th century technology uh, to spy on us. You know, it's a, a slow moving, floating two story white billboard that screams, target me, see me to spy <laughs> on the US. Absurd, right? I mean, it's like saying the NSA is spying on you by sticking a tin can into your wall. <laughs> And attaching a string to it. So it's this kind of absurdity that we're constantly being um, barraged with. But I think anytime we see these types of articles, uh, we can, it's just an exercise. It's a prompt for us to exercise our critical thinking. Yeah. I mean, I want to talk a little bit about this trope of Chinese espionage as well, uh, because you know, as we've, you know, found out within the last few years, if you accuse China of doing something, you know, it's just the target is not just China, but it has uh, profound effects on Chinese people in the US, right? Um, I'm thinking about in particular last year in New York City, two men in Manhattan Chinatown were arrested by FBI authorities. And they were accused of operating uh, what they called what the FBI called a secret Chinese police station in Manhattan Chinatown. Um, you know, as it turned out, this was not a secret Chinese police station at all. It was uh, a center like very similar to a consulate uh, that these two men ran. And it was basically there to help um, immigrants who lived in Chinatown uh, who spoke limited English to help them uh, with paperwork, to help them with renewing their driver's licenses, um, stuff like that. And these uh, centers are not uncommon. Uh, they are often in different Chinatowns uh, across the country, across Canada. Um, but a lot of them, very similarly, uh, were raided by local authorities because of these accusations of them being like a front for a secret Chinese uh, police station. Um, you know, also last year, uh, there was a Chinese American activist named Henry Liang who was arrested um, and accused of being a spy for China. Um, and uh, he was arrested under the FARA, I believe, the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Um, and so, you know, the only thing that he did was advocate for peace and peaceful relations and cooperation between China and the United States, you know. And I'm thinking about, you know, this new period of Red Scare and McCarthyism that we're in, uh, you know, it was in 1950 that Joseph McCarthy, you know, launched the Red Scare. Uh, it was in 1950 because it, you know, soon followed the the Chinese Revolution in 1949, in which the communists took power. 
And the U.S. government really lamented that, really lamented what they called the loss of China. And so they launched this new period of Red Scare. And, you know, it wasn't just limited to the Chinese community in the United States, although the Chinese community was profoundly affected by it. You know, it started within the ranks of the government, within um, the State Department. Its first targets were uh, Chinese experts in the State Department, and then it gradually expanded to other departments in the government, and then eventually toward regular people. Like, regular people became uh, uh, caught up in its crosshairs in this Red Scare. School teachers were accused uh, of being Chinese sympathizers, um, union workers, black liberation activists, so on and so forth, you know, and it ruined thousands of people's lives. Thousands of people lost their jobs, were arrested, had their reputations smeared. So clearly, this kind of new cold, this Cold War mentality and this like McCarthyism, you know, it doesn't just target enemy countries. It, It targets regular everyday people and they get caught in the crosshairs too and their lives get ruined too. So, you know, I'm thinking, you know, you know, that was in 1950, 74 years later, what has really changed, you know? It still seems like the U.S. is still, doesn't know how to grapple with uh, the so-called loss of China, as if China was ever theirs to lose to begin with. Absolutely, you're completely right. I think we've come full cycle. We're back in this uh, red scare, um, yellow peril. Uh, It's just you know, come back in uh, full, in, in, it, in its fullest uh, uh, manifestation. Uh, and I think that, yes, I mean, the damage that it does to people, to people's lives, even to uh, the threat that it actually poses to ordinary people is quite extraordinary. We know that people have been killed. There have been mass shootings of Asians because of this red scare, yellow peril, uh, scaremongering. But coming back just very briefly to that police station, uh, quote unquote, police station incident, this was again put out by an organization called Safeguard Defenders of very, very dubious credibility. I remember this because in South Korea, they also had charges. I actually went online to see where this police station was. It was actually a glass walled restaurant Uh, where they were serving really, really excellent Chinese food. And I thought, my goodness, this sounds like some kind of Jackie Chan comedy movie, you know, where the police are serving food and they're also, you know, uh, you know, uh, holding people hostage. Of of course, impossible because the entire restaurant was glass walled, you know, from top to bottom. But this is the kind of absurdity that we're being told to uh, believe every single day, every day, in and out. You know, it's. I believe that, you know, the farther we are from truth, the closer we are to war, and that those mm. who tell us absurdities are actually preparing us for atrocities. Those atrocities of this rising, escalating war against China. No, uh, I completely agree, and. A- a- you know, it's very clear that we are in the middle of an information war. Uh, it's very clear from, you know, like you said, uh, you know, giving the example of the Chinese spy balloon, but also like the this these sort of same tropes that keep rearing their head, like Havana syndrome, this Chinese base in Cuba. Uh, no matter how many times these two things are debunked, they keep reemerging every few months or so. So it's very clear that uh, the U.S. is really, you know, using, you know, tr- really trying to instigate a war with China. That's all the time that we have for this week. Um, so we'll see you next week on the China Report. Uh, I'm Amanda Yi. And I'm KJ No. Please join us next week and like, subscribe, and share. Mm-hmm.